So, welcome, uh, Professor Bobby Reiner from um, Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, and thank you for getting up so early in the morning to speak to us. Um, yes. Fantastic. Uh, well, uh, yes, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to present, uh, I guess I'm going to call it the version 4.0 uh, of our model. So, my name is Bobby Ryan. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Health Metric Sciences here at University of Washington and also part of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. I want to go uh, a little quickly through uh, the first couple slides uh, just so I can kind of get a little bit more to what we're currently doing as opposed to what we uh, started doing uh, closer to uh, two and a half, three months ago seems like years ago. Um, but at any point in time, please feel free to, to interrupt with questions because uh, I'm, I'm happy to clarify any of the points of what we, what we did in the past as well as what we're doing now. Um, I need to advance my slides now. So uh, back in February, we were asked whether or not we could estimate just for the University of Washington medical system uh, when they think uh, they might have the, the surge uh, of, of people coming in and uh, maybe how big the surge would be relative to their own capacity to deal with uh, uh, people coming in that just need treatment versus people coming in who need uh, intensive care uh, versus people coming in who need ventilation. Uh, to, we uh, started working on an extremely simple model for them. It became, I guess, known around a couple of the medical systems that we started doing this. Uh, so we started getting some requests. Some of the medical systems actually were across states. So then we started estimating more and more states and then we kind of uh, felt we were uh, in for a penny. So we might as well go and try to estimate all US states. Uh, from there, uh, we, we, our first, I guess our first forecast was March 20, Fourth, maybe it was March 21st, one of the two. Um, and, and, and we've been just kind of building from there. Uh, it, it's gotten a lot more attention. And, and of course, the original purposes of the model uh, have been somewhat superseded by uh, questions about what's going to happen uh, later in the fall. Um, and to try to account for both uh, some of the assumptions that we made in the model uh, that had some pretty uh, optimistic uh, usages of uh, movement mandates uh, to try to account for the fact that people are releasing mandates possibly or probably and in some cases very likely way too early um, as well as a potential for a second third and fourth waves uh, we've been building on the model and at, at one point in time we had to make a bit of a, a leap away from our old approach to what I'm going to present as our, our current new approach and we're still we're still iterating seven days a week. Uh, the, what we're trying to do now is to, to account for resurgence in the second wave while uh, forecasting forward what we think is going to happen as a function of things like mobility, increased testing, um, and again, the, the implications of listing the, the social mandates. I seem to have a hard time moving the slides. Uh, so th so there's, a, there's a, a huge amount of information uh, that's, that's coming out and, and a lot more than there was uh, two and a half months ago. Uh, but one of the premises of the work that we started doing was is that we just uh, inherently thought that death data was more reliable than case data given wild biases, especially early on in testing, availability of testing. Uh, certain uh, areas were only testing people who traveled and they wouldn't even look for community transmission. So it's not surprising, it'd be hard to find it. Uh, but death data we hoped would be a little bit more reliable. Um, from there, we also uh, didn't have, uh, without testing, we can't do things like testing and treating or, or uh, uh, really good uh, contact tracing. So instead, we were trying to look at the effect of different non-pharmaceutical interventions and specifically at, at the time, uh, just different restrictions on how people are coming into contact with each other, whether it's uh, reducing any gathers, gatherings at all or uh, closing schools or having to stay at home orders and trying to, to, max, uh, to match that with changes in transmission. And so uh, just as an example, uh, sorry, a lot of this is gonna be US uh, centric, uh, but uh, we've, we've, as uh, people hopefully or, or probably know, we've, we've moved, we've, we've clearly moved out of the US. Uh, so for example, the stay at home order, there's a, a huge variation when different states have implemented the stay at home orders. Um, and to, to be fair, uh, some places haven't. Uh, just one little bit of nuance when I say places haven't, 
Uh, to be able to compare across locations, we had to take relatively strict definitions of the implementation of mandates. And so as I go through this, uh, it should kind of be, uh, you know, we have a, a team of people trying to collect information, get as much an up-to-date uh, status uh, across countries. But uh, if somebody kind of suggested or alluded to the fact that maybe people uh, shouldn't uh, have, let's say, uh, non-essential businesses open, uh, but they just kind of said, oh, it'd be better if maybe the ones that don't have to be don't aren't open. That's not really a, the mandate as opposed to, uh, you know, a governor or a, an elected official getting up and saying this is a decree. And so uh, we had to then, given that we were having these issues with sometimes people uh, kind of get the hint of a mandate without actually having the mandate officially uh, implemented, uh, we looked for other measures of on the ground activity. Another good example is here in, in, in Seattle, uh, where it was kind of the, the first epicenter of the outbreak uh, for the US. Uh, every, every metric of mobility based on cell phone data or uh, you know, uh, Google movement, uh, GPS movement, uh, they all showed that there was reduction in travel even before the mandate started kicking in. So we wanted to try to account for that. Uh, the, the first model, uh, which uh, in, in some ways is a bit infamous, uh, is this is curve fit model. I just want to go quickly through this. Um, I'm not going to make excuses for it because it's definitely it served its purpose. Uh, but but I want to also point out that uh, if people have very nuanced questions about this model, um, I'm happy to take them. But we're we're moving pretty uh, we're pretty close to being able to move entirely away from it. But, uh, for the purposes of that model, though, we were we were making this observation. Uh, I think a lot of people were making a similar observation that there's a somewhat similar trajectory. Um, if you look at the uh, the overall death rate, the, the cumulative death rate. Uh, that uh, in, in, in here, this is a, a figure from a couple months ago where the, the blue line is the cumulative death rate in China. Uh, the x-axis is days uh, since uh, the outbreak hit uh, a death rate of uh, 0.3 per million people. Uh, and you can kind of see if you, if you stare and you believe and you cross your fingers that maybe all of these curves are kind of going up and maybe they're going to all kind of come over uh, the top. Obviously, if we have something where we have more exponential growth, uh, due to, you know, unchecked transmission, uh, we might expect it to not uh, peak out like this. But one of the assumptions that we made early on was that as the outbreak uh, continues in places, people would hopefully take steps uh, to reduce transmission. So then we, we got into the business of trying to understand uh, these curves. Uh, at the time, uh, the only curve that really tells us what happens at the tail would, is the blue line, which is China. But, you know, we have some places in Italy that were starting to come closer uh, to hitting their peak. Uh, for the purposes of the simple analysis of trying to figure out when and maybe how high the magnitude of the outbreak would be, uh, we considered basically curves that are gonna look sigmoidal. Uh, we have you know, uh, the, the, the Logit family of curves and, and we ended up uh, doing a bit of out of sample uh, uh, testing to see which curves fit better and, and the, the curves more related to the, the error function. Uh, seemed to, to, to take a better fit. And so we kind of ran with those functions. There's a, a couple very clear uh, issues with those functions. Uh, the first of which assumes that there, uh, it, it, you basically have a symmetric distribution uh, in terms of the outbreak. Uh, whatever the shape looks like on the way up, it's gonna look the same on the way down, both in terms of how it looks, but also in terms of the, the timing. A couple uh, really nice uh, aspects from the, from the mathematical standpoint for the functions, of course, it's quite easy to take derivatives and then therefore it's quite easy to take uh, uh, find maximums. Uh, and so it's, it's a bit easy to manipulate the function so we could use it and then start maybe trying to add in uh, some other components. But using that, we were able to try to get some good estimate of uh, when we thought that the peak would occur as a function of some covariates. So obviously if we have a place that's just growing uh, unchecked, uh, there's no real great signal in that individual curve that it's gonna stop other than uh, you know, somewhat uh, common sense or, or, or hope. Or we could try to borrow uh, more from a mechanistic mathematical models where we, we know it's gonna come down eventually when we hit herd immunity, but one would hope we don't, uh, we're not waiting that long. Uh, but what we started to do is we started to see when, what was the curvature of the curves looking like in the places that were a bit more advanced as a function of uh, when mandates were, were in place in those locations. And so using that, we could then say, okay, uh, once uh, you know, a stay-at-home mandate was uh, implemented, it's uh, two to three weeks from that point to the peak of deaths. Something like that analysis would then say, okay, this place just implemented uh, their stay-at-home mandate, therefore we have another two or three weeks uh, until they hit their peak. 
Uh, so we were, we were looking across a number of different mandates to try to, to play that game or fit those relationships uh, to help predict what we thought was going to happen. Um, uh, you have to put it in bold, a very critical assumption of the model, which was, again, uh, a bit naive, but uh, in, in several different ways, was that everyone would eventually impose the mandates and then they would keep them on uh, through the first wave. And so, uh, you know, while, while we, we made that assumption, we try to put it front and center. I think a lot of times people would make the, uh, uh, would, would miss that. Maybe we didn't put it in big red letters in the front, but, uh, you know, that was part of the assumptions. And so when people didn't put mandates in, or as people only put some of the mandates in, uh, they were obviously instantly breaking the assumptions of the model, uh, which at the time was, you know, uh, you know, something we knew we were going to eventually have to, to start dealing with. Uh, and so, let's see if I can get the thing to actually move forward. Uh, in some places, uh, this, this did pretty well. Uh, in, in, we were looking in terms of places that kind of hit their peak. Uh, we, have, we, we had a number of issue, uh, examples in Italy where uh, the, the dots are, are the daily and log daily uh, death, uh, and then the curve is what we get uh, by fitting this, this error function. This, uh, of course, is going to then assume that on the way down, it's going to look exactly the same as the way, the way up. Uh, the, the results that we came out with in the, the middle of March uh, pegged the total number of deaths in the U.S. around 80,000, um, as one would hope, uh, making estimates uh, into July that we had pretty wide uncertainty. Uh, estimated, again, under the assumption that, that people are going to keep all their mandates on, that uh, we were going to be able to have uh, death rates dropping below the kind of threshold where we started modeling, uh, so 0.3 per million. And this was a wide variation when we thought that was going to happen uh, as a function of uh, what the transmission looked like in the place and, and, and how many mandates they had already uh, implemented. So uh, I, guess I guess I could stop for a second and see if anybody has any questions on that. Um, it's it's in, in, the, in, the t in the space of COVID uh, timelines, it's a, it's a bit of uh, history. But uh, but happy to take a question before I move on. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy to move on, but don't want to just skip over it. Okay, I got one shake of a head, so I'm going to keep going. There. Uh, so from that point, uh, we as more places experience their peak, uh, we could use more information. So as the model built, more places experience their peak, we, we, we could keep blending that information in. Uh, obviously, only one place that had an outbreak for four months uh, but, you know, other places had had outbreaks for, for one or two months, and so we could start using a lot more information. Uh, we did also start noticing uh, that a number of places didn't satisfy a number of the assumptions of our model. Uh, one of the things we wanted to start trying to do was uh, there's been relatively idiosyncratic patterns in death reporting by location. Some places, they, they don't have a lot of deaths over the weekend, uh, and then they... they uh, possibly for reporting purposes or reasons. Uh, and then all of a sudden they have a huge spike on Monday and we have to figure out how do we want to distribute uh, those deaths, assuming that maybe they didn't all happen on Monday. Some places it happens on Tuesday. Some places they kind of do catch up where once every couple weeks they collect a bunch of deaths that didn't occur in hospitals and just uh, spit them out into the system on one day. So we started trying to figure out how to incorporate deaths and cases and hospitalizations. And then probably uh, more pertinent uh, moving forward and possibly a, a better uh, discussion point for this group, uh, the, a group of us had been for a while advocating uh, that we should probably consider uh, that, the, the, that the right tail of these, uh, these outbreaks is not going to be symmetric. Uh, we want to maybe consider the, the kinds of curves you get out of uh, dynamic transmission models. Uh, and by doing so, we could also start looking at what we think would happen if transmission intensity rebounded uh, in a more natural way uh, than if we, we fit a statistical curve that lets it go back up. Uh, so we, we, we developed and then implemented an SER model uh, that accounts for uh, all future transmission is based exclusively on the SER model um, that uses mobility testing, temperature, and uh, density. And so we take a hybrid model where we blend the two, where we use the, the, the curve fit at the moment to still kind of guide what we think the data looks like uh, today and, and, and up to a week into the future. And then from there, we splice over into a SER model. So one of the reasons we had to do this uh, was there's a lot of places that did not have symmetric tails. So this is a, a bit of, of data for, for Madrid. Uh, pretty clearly, assuming a symmetric tail is going to cut off uh, and, and underestimate uh, what we think is going to happen. A lot of places had um, 
a pretty uh, curious effect where they actually, the, the, t the tail for all intents and purposes actually looked relatively symmetric, but it didn't start immediately after uh, you hit your peak. And so the, a lot of places uh, appeared to have kind of a lingering effect where maybe our effective uh, was uh, bouncing around one or more realistically, possibly we're trying to model an entire large location at once when in fact we're having a lot of small outbreaks going on and when I do the aggregate of all those small outbreaks and, and try to pretend it's one well mixed system uh, we get a pattern that looks uh, curious and, and, and that's uh, another uh, hypothesis that, that makes a lot of sense and that's somewhat of a hint of where we're trying to go with uh, our model 5.0. Um, finally we, we had some examples uh, some unfortunately good examples in the US of places where, albeit small number uh, states of deaths, but places where that were clearly on the uh, the increase already releasing mandates. And so um, for better or worse, this is, uh, the red line is, is basically data from Iowa. Uh, again, small numbers uh, of deaths, but uh, they uh, released their mandate, uh, some of their mandates on, on May 1st. They wanted to, I guess, be first out of the gate. And so uh, trying to account for all these things made us have to rethink a little bit of our approach. One of the other things that we were doing, uh, or what was happening at this time was, obviously we we're collecting a whole bunch more data. Um, a lot more data is just coming out. And so we can be a lot more informed about what we think the relative patterns of infection to fatality are uh, across different ages. And so one of the ways we started to do this was, uh, we can get case fatality rates and obviously uh, case fatality rates depending on what you, how you define a case and how you're hunting down infected, infected people uh, might be quite a bit higher uh, than an infection fatality rate. But if you have a, a closed community like, a, like a, a cruise ship, for example, or you start to do a lot of active case detection, you start getting case fatality rates that get closer and closer to infection fatality rates. We also started leveraging more of the information that was coming out uh, that there wasn't a huge bias in age uh, in terms of infection probability. Obviously, there's a huge effect of uh, age on uh, the probability of severe uh, outcomes or death, uh, but there wasn't as much uh, evidence. Uh, and at the time, the, the evidence looked pretty much like you're equally likely uh, to become infected if you are uh, 20 versus if you're 80. Uh, interestingly, as more serological studies are now coming online, uh, we're, we're, we're gonna try to adjust that a little bit because maybe, maybe there is a little bit of evidence at least in some of the places that are doing serological studies that the, the under 10 might actually have a, a slightly lower probability of infection. But, uh, you know, one location, one survey, we have to take all these things with a grain of salt. And so, so trying to, to try be a little bit more careful about the age structure of infection uh, to fatality allows us to be able to invert what we think is going on in terms of deaths back into what we think is going on in terms of infections, which then opens up um, a somewhat easier way of modeling uh, infections with a uh, mechanistic model as opposed to trying to get into the business of accounting for varying case reporting rates and then using cases in some uh, much more complicated model. Uh, again, we have we started getting a lot more mobility metrics. Uh, they don't all agree, sorry for the, the size of this plot, but the, the left panel is uh, different mobility metrics uh, in, in Washington relative to baseline. So the, the dashed line is uh, business as usual. Uh, some of these metrics say that movement, depending on how you define movement, you're saying you're going to work, or you're just leaving your home, or you're traveling a certain distance. Uh, different sources are giving us different information. Uh, sometimes those are uh, consistent, Lombardia, uh, the different movement metrics are consistent, but we're trying to figure out how to incorporate uh, that into a single measure of mobility change since February 15th and use that in the model. When we do that, we can then start playing uh, the, uh, a little bit more of an informative game of, of how well does changes in movement match uh, changes in the mandate. So did a movement occur, uh, change before mandate came or after mandate came? And, and can we say, okay, well, what do we think would happen if you release this mandate in terms of movement, and movement specifically? Uh, we do then able to play the game in the other direction saying movement change, transmission intensity seem to change. How well did that correlate? Um, uh, it's a, a discussion I think was being alluded to earlier, and it's a discussion that, that we and many other people are having whether or not uh, removing a mandate is going to have the same effect as implementing the mandate, not in terms of movement, but now that people are doing all these other things like distancing or wearing masks, uh, we don't necessarily expect uh, the, the same rebound in terms of transmission intensity, but we can start looking at these things. Uh, we, we then, of course, have places, uh, again, uh, places in the U.S. are a good example where uh, 
people are removing their mandates uh, while there's still a good evidence that transmission is, is, is circulating. And, and we're already, uh, to some extent, starting to see uh, the impact of, of those things. Um, finally, we're, we're, we're trying to account for a lot more information. One of the big things is, is testing. Uh, testing is first going to expose more cases and more infections. And so more testing might make it look like there's a worse problem. And, and our um, esteemed leader thinks that maybe it's a bad idea to test more people because then they'll we'll identify more cases, which is brilliant. But that being said, it, it also might be able to be used uh, to remove infectious people from the population, identify them and identify uh, their friends and family contact tracing that might actually become another uh, intervention uh, in, in, the, in the very, uh, very empty toolkit uh, that we have. And then uh, finally, again, just because we're having, you know, we're waiting longer, we'll, we'll have a lot more information about what, what does a peak look like? Uh, what does it look like on the way back down? And can we start to figure out why some places are sharper, some places aren't, some places last longer at the peak, some places don't. Uh, so one of the things uh, that we, we tried to do in the death space of the model is uh, start to take into consideration that the cases aren't maybe as, uh, as, as, uh, it has as big of an issue as we uh, they did before. Maybe they're becoming a little bit more stable, or at the very least, maybe relative to their own measure, uh, they're stable. So if I say cases are going to be biased in a particular location, but are the la next eight weeks higher or next eight days higher than the last eight days? Even if it's biased, maybe there's a trend that we can learn from. And so we started trying to borrow that trend to to, to get a little bit further out into what we think is going on in terms of uh, deaths, uh, and then from there. Again, we have to be uh, very careful. Uh, there's huge issues in terms of uh, huge spikes in, in death reporting. Some of it obviously is that uh, there is a distribution of time from when a person gets infected to when a person dies. It's gonna be a function of all sorts of things, when and if they sought treatment, comorbidities, what kind of treatment they were able to get an access to. But again, the reporting ends up being a big issue. So we have to worry about smoothing the data. Uh, and then finally, uh, dealing with this uh, issue in, in, in this curve fit way of, of, of extending the peak or having uh, a long tail. Uh, uh, we loved our, our error functions. We stuck with error functions, uh, but we then basically used error functions as basis functions and then basically did a spline regression uh, using them as the splines uh, to try to get an extended peak. And this also uh, will allow us to get a bit of the, the asymmetry depending on the weights uh, we put on the various splines. But then the, the, the kind of uh, the next uh, direction we're, we, we've gone and, and we are going to continue going as an SER model. So uh, I'm going to try to go a little quickly through all this because I see I'm, I'm, I'm already 22 minutes in. But uh, so I'm not going to say what an SER model is, but uh, we have two uh, infectious components uh, because there's a good amount of evidence that first people might not be PCR positive uh, until they're into their infectious stage. So if I'm going to be using uh, testing uh, as uh, one of my uh, measures of transmission or possibly an intervention, I want to be able to separate out those that actually would be able to be detected from PCR versus those that might be contributing to transmission. The second reason is there's also a good amount of evidence that there's a, even for those that eventually become symptomatic, there's a pre-symptomatic phase where they're walking around uh, feeling fine but infecting other people. And so there's two different reasons that we put uh, uh, two different uh, infectious classes. We also, you might notice very small there, there's an alpha term. Again, we're fitting large places in aggregate, assuming a well-mixed uh, model, which is, is obviously wrong for many, many different reasons. Um, but to, to try to account for the fact uh, that we are not really modeling one population, but entire states, and in some circumstances, entire countries at once, uh, we, we, we put a, an alpha term to kind of dampen uh, the effect to account for the fact that we're not well-mixed. So the, the model approach is basically take uh, what we think are deaths from the death curve model, uh, convert them into infections by delaying them from using a distribution about time from death back to infection using the infection fatality rate. From there, we fit an SEIR model. Uh, from there, we get in a transmission intensity. Uh, well, we're, 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 we're matching the, or tracking the, the beta term in the, in the transmission intensity. We then try to regress or understand the, the change in that through time as a function of a change in a bunch of covariates like movement, uh, density, temperature, um, testing. And we then try to forecast those covariates. Some of those are very easy to forecast. Density is hopefully not gonna change. Temperature, there's an entire field of people that are in the business of doing that. Uh, testing is obviously something that we, a bit more hypothetical. Uh, we then take the forecasted uh, covariates 
plug them into the regression, get forecasted betas, put that through the SCR model, and we get a forecasted uh, outbreak. We then convert that back into deaths. And that's the, the current approach to, to try to account for uncertainty. We're doing this deterministically at the moment, um, the, the SEIR component of this, uh, but to try to account for uncertainty, uh, the, the deaths that get converted into infections, they get fed through the model, they have variation from the original uh, curve fit model. And so the whole thing ends up being, being done by draw. Uh, I point that out because we do this by a thousand draws and we're up to, I think, 160 locations. And so we have a, a whole a math team uh, that we're able to work up algorithms to take the original model, which would take uh, me three minutes to fit. And now they can do, you know, 1500 fits in, in, in two minutes, which is, is pretty uh, incredible. Uh, the, one of the ways they do this uh, is by playing a bit of a game uh, with solving the system of differential equations by actually just fitting a, cur a smooth to new infections because that's the data that the data that's coming into the model. And then from there running uh, just three ODEs just directly through, not really solving, well, not at all solving them, just running them through, then doing a bit of algebra at the end. It's, it's, a, it's a nice approach. Um, at the moment, uh, we were using an assumption of concavity. Uh, so like California, you can see it goes up, comes down. But now that we're uh, in places where it's no longer doing that, uh, we have to be a little bit more careful about that open, that first spine. That's one of the things we're at right now. Um, I mentioned the regression, we put the regression and I'm, I'm gonna start going a little faster because I wanna get to a bit of the results. Uh, mobility, uh, and then from there, we're able to get curves that look, well, at least they're not um, extremely certain about what's gonna happen uh, in August. And so that's something that I think we, uh, nobody was really happy with, with the original models. And so the whole thing uh, goes through uh, quite quickly. Uh, so we were able to repeat this over and over again to, to, to play more and more experiments. One of the things, uh, so, so the, the, the current projection uh, for the US, 143,000 deaths uh, by August 1st, uh, obviously, uh, well, this is under the assumption that all the mandates that are currently on are gonna stay on. All the mandates we know are gonna come off are gonna come off when we know they're gonna come off, which is obviously a bad assumption. Uh, so we have to update this. We're now trying to become in the business of forecasting when people are gonna remove mandates, but that's, that's an that's a exercise. Uh, but we have moved out of the US to try to estimate this for other places. And, and uh, this map will be growing substantially over the next two weeks as we move into uh, India and Pakistan and, and South Africa and, and a number of other states. Uh, but we're trying to account for uh, uh, some other biases in data. So we can actually do it for, for lower middle income countries just writ large. One of the things we get to do uh, is we can then say, uh, we, we have an effect of, of the mandates, we have effective movement on transmission. We can then say, what happens if I remove one of those mandates? Uh, how do I think that that's gonna affect mobility? And then how do I think that's gonna affect transmission? So we can say, where are you in your outbreak? Do you have a low R effective? Do you have enough room in your R effective to remove a mandate? Increase transmission a little without letting the outbreak occur. So for example, in this particular draw in California, we have an individual timing of when we could remove different mandates, uh, assuming that this is exactly the right truth, uh, and assuming that the effect of the mandate going off is the same as the effect of the mandate going down, uh, not on mobility, but on transmission. We could say when we think the timing of the different mandates could be removed. Then we have other states uh, where, uh, for example, in Ohio, the effect of school closures was pretty massive on, on mobility wherefore it ended up being massive on transmission uh, and Ohio never seems to get a low enough uh, in their transmission by the end of the fall or the end of the summer to allow them to have space to bring back uh, school closure. Although they wouldn't open schools possibly until the fall anyway. But these are the kinds of, of, of questions we can ask. We can do the whole thing uh, by draw so we can start getting uncertainty on when it would be advisable uh, to lift different mandates. I'm getting closer to the end. Um, Obviously, this is one way of making that life choice about balancing the economics uh, with the health. Our effective of one is actually a pretty uh, scary thing when you start allowing for stochasticity uh, and measurement errors across the board. And so maybe we, some uh, a more risk adverse governor might say, "I want to keep, I want to only have a certain fraction of more deaths." Uh, can can you can you work up a scenario? And that's kind of what we're working on. So we're trying to move entirely away from curve fit uh, to just directly use cases, hospitalizations. Uh, deaths and testing data, uh, so we can uh, we still have a bit of some assumptions that go into the model. Obviously, there are more intervention strategies than just mandates. We're trying to incorporate those. Tons of other covariates we'd like to incorporate. Uh, we're trying to move to every location uh, that has greater than 50 deaths and high quality cause of death data. That's step one. Uh, but then step two is is really trying to move into places 
uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, where the death date itself is going to be uh, biased and so we can no longer leverage this. Well, the death date is better than the case data, so therefore we, we probably think we know what's going on. So we have to be a lot more uh, careful about things. And so uh, obviously a lot of different uh, issues. But with that, I'm, I I'm hopefully have a couple minutes for questions, but thank you uh, for your attention. Uh, thanks very much. If you could, Martina. So thank you, Bobby, both for um, agreeing to give this talk in uh, record time. And it was a great talk, really. Um, I've been wanting to see what's behind the curtain for some time. So this was sure. uh, very helpful. So uh, a couple of things. Um, first, uh, you know, everybody attacks the assumptions. But the thing about assumptions and models is that they tell us what would happen if. And so they're, they're really just ways of leveraging uh, sort of computation to answer complex questions, basically. Uh, so thinking back on version 1.0, which made this assumption that every place that started its lockdown would keep its lockdown until it needed to, you can almost argue that that gives you a baseline for what might have been possible if you had followed this policy all the way to its conclusion faithfully. And then everything that happens above that is sort of an excess death, which is a cost of reopening. Are, is that discussion happening in your shop or does nobody want to touch that with a 10 foot pole? Um, so, I, so there's a queue of things we want to look at. <laughs> um, at the moment, uh, the resources that are working on, on COVID aren't, aren't uh, funded on COVID. So a lot of us are trying to actually keep our day jobs going as we do this. Uh, do some that. of the people have just transitioned uh, over uh, entirely, but uh, that is more along the lines. We have like a list of like postmortems that we okay. would like to do. Uh, that is squarely in the, in the postmortem uh, space. Uh, we, we, it's a bit of a, a tricky political issue yeah. in terms of uh, we we do seem to have some traction uh, at, at the different levels of government in terms of uh, we're not one of the groups that's just not being listened to at all. Um, so we might, uh, you know, the, the, but uh, so putting out something like that now uh, may not be the might time. Hurt that, but I mean, realistically, I, I think we would if we had if we had the the the, the human resources. Um, but you could the, almost turn it around. To So here in Washington State, where I think you, you obviously have the ear of the governor, and the governor, I think, is a rational man, um, in a sense, what you're offering now is a metric for what it's costing us at each stage, right? So here's what we might have been able to obtain, and here's kind of where we are. So instead of saying, this is your fault, it's, it's really just a metric for how much is it costing us to relax these restrictions, and that might be a useful metric for them. Oh, no, absolutely. And so I, I guess to, to kind of allude to, to kind of answer the question. So I, I, I did I had to go through it very quickly. But in those the, the mandate release slide, there was two colors. The 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 first color, the, the top color was when our effective was less than one, but not far enough less than one that you could remove a mandate. And so that's a cost that you're paying economically by, by not removing a mandate. And then below that, there was more of the salmon, I guess, color uh, that represented the the extra transmission you were allowing by implementing, by removing the mandate. And so there's, there's exactly that balance. Okay. I think one of the reasons why it's a little tricky to go back to the beginning um, is because the model, uh, trying to forecast what we think is happening, given that we know there's some issues with the, with the old model we had as well, uh, makes it a little, like wh what reality do we pretend we, we're in if we want to make that postmortem, do we pretend we were back in the beginning of March where we had a very limited amount of data or do we pretend we actually knew what was going to happen, fit the model there and then play that, play that, play that game out. Um, and so it's, it's, it's probably much easier to do the second thing than the first thing, but that's not really quite fair for the people who are making the policy decisions at the time. But it, it's definitely something that I think is, um, is relevant and it is something that we should be doing. Thanks. Do, do we have one, one more question? Cause we, Right. And perhaps need to get on to our general discussion. Uh, I guess I do if no, oh, Peter does, good, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Peter Traban from Stockholm University, um, Sweden. Uh, my question is a bit about the mathematics uh, of the model. Uh, 
and I so when you show the S E I I R model uh, implicitly or explicitly in that model, you you assume that there are exponential times until people recover. It's a ordinary differential equation. Absolutely. For some, uh, it is known in theory that uh, that assumption might have quite big effects. Uh, Absolutely. Did you consider uh, making that a bit more? It, I guess it comes at a uh, small cost to generalize that uh, the distribution to something more realistic. Yeah, yeah. So that's extremely well taken. Um, that is, uh, it is sometimes a bit of a, a struggle to to to, to change. Uh, so to going to an SER model at all was definitely. Um, an effort uh, that is 100% uh, accurate. We're, we're I'm trying to continually remind people that uh, we have a whole bunch of exponential distributions going on. So people are shooting through these 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 classes quite fast. Where we know some of them don't, you know, they have actual uh, like lags. Uh, we're uh, that's more on the developmental side, but there there are other teams obviously that that are worrying much more about the exact distributions. Uh, and we're trying to, the very least, make it, uh, you know, do the, the boxcar trick uh, to at least make it so that we don't have so many people flying through in the beginning. But realistically, there's, there's other people that are saying it's not just going to be, you know, a gamma. It actually has a particular shape, and we should use that particular shape uh, as we move forward. And so that's, that's something we're trying to use. Um, again, doing it, you know, 1,500 times uh, makes it, you know, any, you know, if you make it a second longer, uh, it, it does end up really starting to add up, uh, but it is something that uh, we're aware of, and it is also something that, that at least as we start uh, putting out manuscripts associated with this work, which is I think something we've really not done a great job of doing, uh, those are the kinds of robustness ass uh, assessments we need to do, where we say, what happens if you change that distribution? Do you get a wildly different result? And if you do, oh, well, we should probably be couching what we're doing uh, much more carefully. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's extremely well taken, and, and I'm... I'm fully aware that, that, that we're, we're making some pretty, pretty strong assumptions in that space. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. thanks. I think we need to leave that there and move on to our general discussion. So thanks very much for coming to Cambridge, Bobby, and uh, we hope okay. you'll uh, take some interest in the further parts of the program as we, we're here till August. So thanks. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. Okay.